welcome. I, as you may know already, am Elizabeth Dale Dynas from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and I am incredibly grateful and so incredibly excited um, to learn from him that Kareem um, Amin is here. And Kareem, will you jump in and introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kareem Amin. I am the executive director of Voices of 21217. And, well, and have been a long time educator in Baltimore, tour in Baltimore City Public Schools, charter schools and things like that. So I have a lot of experience um, working with youth. And so you'll learn a little bit more about my program as we go through the training. Yeah. Um, so the reason that we are having both of us here and the reason the slides are formatted the way that you see in front of you is because we're going to be having kind of a conversation um, across time Whereas where I from the Smithsonian American Art Museum and representing our collection um, will be looking at a set of photographs made 50 years ago in East Baltimore. And then Kareem as a Baltimore native and representative of contemporary West Baltimore is going to be talking about today. And so we'll have this conversation back and forth. If you don't know a thing about Baltimore, that is totally okay because the intention is to uncover our gaps in understanding and figure out how, how we can fill them. So continuity and change over time, just as a tiny bit of background information, if you're not an AP US history teacher, is apparently one of the most challenging AP US history essay questions to teach for, because students are often more comfortable identifying the things that have changed than identifying the things that have stayed the same. And so when we're thinking about that, even in the art classroom or the history classroom or the general ed classroom in an elementary school, recognizing that there's a lot to be learned by looking at two points in time and thinking about why in the world were some things allowed to stay the same and how did it come to pass that some things are different? So that's like kind of the thesis of our time together. And in order to get into all of this, we're gonna be using some thinking routines, surprise, surprise, um, with some of the historical photographs from the um, Smithsonian's um, exhibition called Welcome Home. And then we're going to look at some of the works made by Korean students um, just this past year. So to get us started, we're going to take a look at this photograph. And my invitation to you, as always, is to look. Um, this time, if you're familiar with this kind of close looking, you'll notice that I have actually included the tombstone or the information, the label text on the bottom right. And that's intentional, this is fair play. Um, so my invitation to you is first to just pay really close attention to the photograph and look all over it. Notice the light, notice contrast, notice texture, notice the framing, notice how close or far from the subject the photographer is. Think about what might be cropped out of the photograph, so the world outside of this image. Think about the way that the photographer is guiding your eye. So depending on where the photographer stands in relation to their, their sitter or um, their subject, they've arranged the picture in such a way that we're being called to look at something. And looking 10 by two is a way to invite all of us to really, really slow down, surprise. Um, but the first thing is the 10 things that you see kind of first. So into the chat box, make a quick list of 10 things that are just like, boop, ready to, like you can just point to them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Just drop those into the chat box. Ordered windows, thank you, Sarah. You gotta start it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ooh, Sarah has noted an absence. So those points seem to be missing behind the head of these young men. Broken brickwork. Melissa, now you know I'm gonna ask, what do you see that makes you say that the building was once grand? Would you be willing to unmute and share aloud? What are you noticing that you could point to? Well, actually, um, 
so so it's there are two things and one is the the caption and i know because of the of you know the background of these photographs that the photographers didn't really caption these um with you know pithy two or three word titles yep. they wrote notes on the back of the um photographs uh, and they might be pretty lengthy, and this one was. And it, yeah. this one says, Banker Gunther Mansion, Ooh. Butcher's Hill. And it does look like a very substantial um, building. You wouldn't necessarily think it might have been somebody's home, but it, it's, it's got, you know, rounded portions and, and pieces that jut out, and it's all brick. That would have been an expensive, um, you know, material to use. Yeah. And wow. it's, you know, it's, but so it was grand, but now it's kind of falling apart. It's deteriorating. Yeah. Thank you. That's so brilliant. So noticing the photographer's word choice and the notes that are provided on the right side. Um, so I see like, well, to you and Melissa said the word mansion and noticing all these architectural details. But then also at the same time, we've got Angel saying there are weeds there. Jennifer is noticing broken windows. Um, and then also we have these three people, three black males are identified. Um, and it seems as though there's this kind of um, gate kind of between them and the, the building. Okay, so that if that's our first pass at 10, I'm going to invite everybody in the room to unmute and we're going to step on each other and that's okay, but this is just a chance for us to all speak. Name one more thing that we haven't named. So we're going to aim for another list of 10. Who would like to start us off? And I can call on you if you'd prefer. The, the subjects all have their arms kind of stuck out by kind okay. of akimbo they're very it's a very powerful kind of stance even the young one in the middle you Beautiful. know they they look they look very co comfortable and like they belong there you know mm -hmm. thank you i wonder if they're related so that's very serious tell me more what do you see that makes you say serious um, their expressions their body language i think it, i mean they definitely look relaxed but they look more like you know, it's not like they're smiling in front of, you know, a, a, a statue or, you know, or something that they're visiting. It looks like they're like, it's almost like they're making a statement, but I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. Okay. They're so, so both be, it's not like a special occasion place where they are they they, right. they feel as though they belong there and also there's a, a certain amount of wariness did i understand you yeah kind of like i'm trying to figure out like what they're conveying with their expressions like are they happy to be there is this something they um wanted to be in front of um yeah. It, it, I just I can't figure out like, like what they're why they're you know why they're, they're they're more of a serious look than a look. You have <laughs> anticipated my next question, so let's put a pin in that because that's actually a really important component to me of this photograph. Okay, can I hear from like two other people? What's something you see in the picture that we haven't no mentioned yet? It almost it almost feels like the photographer asked them. Can I take a picture of you? And then they said, okay. And they're kind of posing and waiting for the photographer to finish taking the picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they wondering, the are you done yet? Um, <laughs> I like that. That's such an interesting story. Somebody else jumped in. Please, please keep going. No, I was just going to add on that they seem impatient. Um, mm -hmm. But I also had this weird feeling like they're super proud and claiming territory mm. um, just with the, I guess, like the gesture, or like the pose that they kind of have, but they also seem really impatient the more I look at them. Yeah, so there's this like, there's a comfort, but a distance, but a patience, but an impatience, there's, there's something kind of... Um 
there is something uh, like almost captured a captured moment that's a little indescribable it seems like and, and I appreciate that Sarah Coors is also mentioning that her ancestors wore long underwear so it's a surprise <laughs> that we have these bare chested <laughs> men in this picture which I are young men um, and, and a boy. So yeah, this is like a, a, a noteworthy item to put on our list. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's keep going. We've already started to kind of like pick at the edges of this. And my invitation to you right now is when you put the image and the caption together, what kind of a thesis statement could there be? Like what, what, could the big idea of this photograph be? What's the point? And if you need to talk it out because that's the way you think, unmute and jump in. Otherwise, drop an idea into the chat box. Kind of what's the main idea or big idea of this question or question, photograph? <laughs> Accessibility of the mm -hmm. once inaccessible. I like yeah. that. Definitely put a pin, put a pin in that, but I'm gonna be talking about that a lot later. Yeah. Thank you. And Sarah, if you're willing to add a piece of evidence for what you see or know, I would love to know what you could point to in the picture or in the tombstone text that would support that. Sure. Um, so what I noticed was, and I can't tell for sure, but there's one particular window or doorway that seems to be open and available mm -hmm. to access. And there's, you can tell that it's worn, that what Brickworks worn is that people have gone in there. Yeah. And then of course I mentioned before about the points above the African-American um, gentlemen, they're gone. So yes. you can really see where people have gone over um, the, the wall essentially and been able yeah. to go into. And so it looks like something that people have are very familiar with going in and out of now. Yeah. But when you look at the caption, it was a mansion at one time. And so that particular wall had a very different intention at one time. Yes. People out. And so that's a really interesting concept of being able to get into something now that at one time was an was a intentional barrier. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, some notes about um, perhaps the worth of the or the value of these buildings, um, which I know Kareem will get into later also. Um, the stance looks to me like they're saying this is my neighborhood, but that also um, Melissa is noting that the neighborhood is in flux or changing. Would anyone else like to add an idea about what the main idea of this image might be? <laughs> um, I, I like think about abandonment like abandoned homes but they but they're still like there so I don't know if it's like lingering abandonment but um or if it's like the boys may be abandoned too but I definitely feel like the building has been abandoned and it's kind of like run down and just a sense of like loss in memory yeah. now. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to put that as a main idea though. That was just, <laughs> I, I like, I like that you posited it as a outspoken idea. That was, it's wonderful to hear other voices. I mean, I like um, what Sarah said in the chat box, actually, she's yeah. probably better at writing down the ideas than I am. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Melissa's adding, wouldn't it be a great community center? I love this. Okay, so then let's catch in the chat box. Everybody just ask a quick question. Like if you were gonna ask a question in order to better understand the main idea of this photograph, what question would you ask and of whom? And we're not gonna read all of them. This is just the, to get in the practice of posing a question and also identifying the person or source you would ask that question to. So one minute to write a question and identify the source that you would ask. Kareem, who, what question would you ask and who would you ask it of? I would say, where are them? these young men now? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Are they, are they still, are they still around? If they are, you know, what are they doing? Do they still live in those neighborhoods? Because Butcher Hill was an expensive neighborhood that then kind of went down a bit, as you can see around the early 80s. Um, 
late seventies, early eighties with urban renewal. And then now it's an expensive neighborhood again. So mm-hmm. it was like gentrified and ungentrified and gentrified again. And so yeah. I'm wondering if those young men still live in that neighborhood, if they still live in that neighborhood, well, they wouldn't be young men anymore, but do they still live in the neighborhood? What are they doing? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that's what I would, that's what I would uh, see. That personal history part seems personal really important. History. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. So while the questions filter in, you already know what we're going to do, which means that we can do it faster this time. Oops. Hold on, friends. Great view. Again, really quickly, I just need 10, step, 10 things that you can notice about this new photograph, which is of the same neighborhood, same time period, um, perhaps just a different part. What do you notice? So I notice the dog, especially because I am dog crazy right now. <laughs> Melissa's noticing perhaps multiple generations. What more are we noticing? Scaffolding, thank you. So we've got the scaffolding in the left side, some reflections of the scaffolding in the window there. Two dogs, Jen, are you a dog lover too, I wonder? There's glass. Okay. Love it. So these are not boarded up windows. These are windows with glass in them. Like it. Anything more that we're noticing? No railing on the stairs. Thanks, Dan. Valerie's noticing there's a sign in the window, the stoop. So this white marble stoop is like a signature part of this particular neighborhood in Baltimore. We actually have um, a work by an, a sculptor in the Renwick's collection, which is a realistic pillow sculpted out of one of the stoops that had been discarded into a public space. Um, so back to this idea of beautiful marble stairs that then got discarded and now are finding um, value again, this kind of ebb and flow of a city, um, an exterior entrance for coal or a similar basement access. Sarah, you are always the one to go to for like really important details that I would not necessarily notice. So this little door on the bottom right corner of the photograph. Okay, so this, this space had heat um, and, and basement access. Okay, so oop, oh my gosh, you guys, what am I doing? <laughs> Nope, it's, well, then we're just gonna talk it through because my animation's not working. So then um, we've named all the things. What is the big idea of this photograph? Neighbors often visit on their front steps an extension of their living rooms. This entire block of East Baltimore Street is being renovated through the private enterprise in Butchers Hill. So what's the big idea of this photograph? The closeness of neighbors. Are we allowed to unmute? Yeah, jump in. Okay. Um, it, well, the title is Together, and it kind of reminds me of back in my neighborhood in New York City when all of like the kids and like the grandmas and the babysitters would hang out on the stoops yeah. and listen to the radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just kind of like one of those communal things that your neighborhood does. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen it here because it's kind of like suburban <laughs> in Virginia, um, but I can I can imagine that this happens in Baltimore if there's like um, neighborhoods, like more urban neighborhoods, but this idea that kind of like news passes through the stoops, mm. like you hear things mm-hmm. that are going on in the neighborhood from like people if you're hanging out on the stoop. So um, that, that's what I think. I love that. Thank you for that. And so Jen and Sarah and Angels are all backing up this idea of community and closeness, but I really appreciate this added layer of personal experience of like the grandma telephone network. Everybody hears everybody's stuff that's happening in the building and keeps an eye out for each other, all these different things. Yeah, like all the gossip uh, happens on the stoop. Right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, and these really important social interactions. Oh yeah, the grapevine, perfect. Okay, so 
this seems like it seems like we've come to a more comfortable understanding of what this particular photograph is about. Whereas last one we wrote, we, we felt a bunch of, of tension, we we or or distance or uncertainty or something like that. In this photograph, it feels a little bit like we get the idea a little bit um, more like we got that, we put our hands around that. And I think that's an interesting thing to just make note of. Um, so the last thing then would be, even though we've come to a comfortable thesis, a, a statement of what this photograph is about, if you were gonna ask a question to better your understanding, what question would you ask and who would you ask it of? Will you put some questions into the chat box, please? There's a reason I'm driving them toward the chat box because we're gonna have like a, just a running list of, of queries in the chat box. What time of day? Yeah, the, the light in this image, it's definitely coming from kind of the upper right side of the photograph. Are you related to each other or just neighbors? questions do we have and who would we ask them of? Are you new to the neighborhood or have you been living here for a long time? Interesting. Why were the three young men race brought up in what you see in this one, but not for this family? Interesting. Thank you. Do you work together too, or just perhaps live together? Do the children still live in the neighborhood? Beautiful. So while the last few questions filter in, I'll just let you know that as Kareem was talking about earlier, Butcher's Hill was this really um, affluent neighborhood. It was actually sort of got settled in the 1850s. Um, it was an area that initially was kind of away from the core of Baltimore and then Baltimore grew up around it by 1915. And um, because it was an affluent neighborhood, because it was like very much pre-zoning laws, there's this really wide variety of architecture. And on, I think it's the North South streets, if I'm remembering correctly, let me see. Ah, sorry, East West streets have the big homes. Then the medium sized homes are on the North South um, streets. And then the small homes are kind of on the alley. So there's like a mixture of um, sizes of homes, lots of people living there. It's this hilly topography, about a thousand buildings in this one particular neighborhood. Um, and the name Butcher's Hill kind of fell out. You didn't use that in like around World War I, but just like people weren't calling it Butcher's Hill anymore. Um, and in fact, this guy that grew up there said, there was no Butcher's Hill, you were from East Baltimore. But then in the seventies, at the time that this photograph was taken, when we're talking, you know, seeing this note about renovation through private enterprise, um, the Neighborhood Association resurrects the name Butcher's Hill and the Southeast Community Organization started to buy and sell homes to be redeveloped for single family occupancy. So this is a very much as, as Kareem was saying before, a neighborhood in transition. So I wanna show you the, um, exhibition trailer because in this we get a little bit more of a glimpse not only into the neighborhood that's being photographed but also the photographers themselves because it's kind of an exceptional um, situation in which um, these three women photographers were going into the community with a purpose of kind of documenting it and as we watch this I want you to just kind of start to flag which of the questions in the chat box have actually been answered by the trailer or anything that I just said. And then also, what new questions do you have? So occupying this position of curiosity. Um, if we have any trouble with the audio, just give me a wave and we'll figure it out together. So here we go. The exhibition Welcome Home originated as a photography survey that was carried out in the 1970s in the neighborhood of East Baltimore. A photography survey is sort of a look at a place, an attempt to understand and capture it. In this case, groups of photographers were funded by the National Endowment for the Arts to survey or look closely at places across the United States in celebration of the bicentennial of the nation's founding. What was unique to the East Baltimore survey was that it was carried out by three women photographers, Linda Rich, Eleanor Kahn, and Joanne Netherwood. Linda Rich, the project leader, had just come to Baltimore to teach documentary photography at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Eleanor Kahn and Joanne Netherwood, who were both local, were two of Rich's students at MICA. 
In fact, they were two of her older students. The three of them worked on the project for over five years, during which they made more than 10,000 exposures. When we think of Baltimore, we think of a city that looks different from the Baltimore in these photographs. And that's in part due to the historical background of who lived in Baltimore at that moment. Immigrants to Baltimore in the 1800s were mostly German, but certainly Eastern European. And that's really the community that stayed there and is represented in this documentation. The photographers documented a wide range of interior and exterior spaces. They went on top of buildings to take broad vistas, but they also did a kind of street photography so you would have a sense of the neighborhood itself. I think that it did affect the relationship of the photographers with the community that all three photographers were women. Being women in some ways gave them access to homes where other people might not have had that easy access. They started out going through the churches and other community institutions. That's how they were introduced to their subjects. And then gradually they were brought into the private lives of their subjects and they photographed christenings and backyard lunches. They went indoors and photographed the details of people's lives. And they also visited people's workplaces. In order to document the community, the photographers really focused on what was important to its members. Work, tradition, family, religion. For example, there's a photograph by Joanne Netherwood of Melissa Masseroni after her first communion. And I love this picture for all of the many things that it does. On the left-hand side of the picture, she has included the photographer who is taking a picture of this girl. She's also included on the right-hand side a piece of his equipment, which is the umbrella, the flash umbrella that bounces light onto her. And then more or less at the center is Melissa herself. So you have the photographer making a picture of a photographer, making a picture of this girl who is posed standing next to Christ. And this is her unique special moment in her childhood. And at the same time, between her and the umbrella is a line of little girls all dressed identically. And so it's this wonderful moment of both the individual being pictured and the performance of sameness that is part of citizenship in East Baltimore at this time. What I Okay, this is a wonderful th uh, trailer, but I'm going to pause it here because it goes on a bit longer than we needed to. Um, so just distill in your mo in your head for a moment, the ideas that just flowed past you. Scroll back through the chat box and just notice, have any of our questions been answered so far? And then with all that in mind, what questions remain? What do, what do we still need to know about East Baltimore, about this time period, about the people in the pictures, the neighborhoods? What, where are our gaps in knowledge and how do we turn those gaps into questions? Sarah's got one question answered. Love it. Question, it looks very multicultural in these photographs. Is it still that way? I had a very a similar question. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. How did the diverse communities engage with each other beyond the photographs, right? Love it. How the fact that women photographers took the photos, how did that impact the expressions and stances of the subjects? Yeah, so when we look at portraiture at all, um, there's a, it's sort of a conversation between the sitter and also the person making the portrait. 
how's the culture, how, shared culture and community um, gathering changed? I love that. So, you know, this idea of connection, 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 we see that as a, a running theme, the places where people get together, the, 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 you know, the grapevine, these workplaces, all of these things, and particularly in the past 18 months, um, this idea of culture and community and where we gather has, has been um, shifted dramatically. Anything more that we're still curious about? Women's work, how has it changed over time? Mm, good question, good question. I think also it's a really interesting sort of the adjunct to that is there was an emphasis on the um, Eastern European migration that was happening between that portion of the world and Baltimore. And as people became more familiar with Baltimore city, like how did their thinking, how did their work change? Um, there's harmony in this community and people together. How did the community feel about being documented? Beautiful. Do the children still live and work there? And um, Melissa is interjecting, and it's important to note that this project went on for five years. So this level of engagement with the community, 10,000 exposures, it's, it's a very documented community for sure. So we're going to continue to kind of um, build questions, but as a bridge between past and present, I wanted to, sorry. My brother is calling me. He doesn't know we're having a workshop right now. Um, the me, exhibition Welcome Home. Great. I'm just going to push all the buttons this evening. Um, I wanted to show everyone that what we have been talking about so far is the neighborhood that's kind of in the circle there on the right side. So this is our East Baltimore kind of hub. Um, and Baltimore. Kareem has so many neighborhoods and each neighborhood has like a really strong sense of identity and pride and and I didn't know that I've been a tourist in Baltimore but I've never ever lived there mm -hmm. and I just wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what you understand of your city and then tell us a little bit more about your neighborhood because you are in West Baltimore and you've been documenting West Baltimore with your students. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, growing up in Baltimore, we are very much a east, east, what do they call it, east side or west side. And so we're very much divided into east and west, and that's with all the neighborhoods. So you may have someone that lives in east Baltimore, but they literally will never go to west Baltimore. They may fly to, uh, to Germany. They may go to Spain. Um, where you're about to go down very, you know, very soon, but we'll literally never go to West Baltimore and vice versa. People that are in West Baltimore will never go to East Baltimore. They'll travel around. I know people that travel around the world, have very successful careers that never go to the other side of town unless they're shopping or something like that. They never go. And so East Baltimore, West Baltimore, that's always been sort of, sort of, uh, I guess you would call, I don't know if it would be a rivalry, but more or less like two different towns. Um, in one city where literally um, you could go around 695, which is our beltway within like 40 minutes. So we're, um, we're probably as big as maybe Brooklyn as a city, but yet people do not go to the, to each side of, uh, of town. Um, I also wanted to highlight this highway to nowhere. So where you see right here with Johns Hopkins University is I actually was interested growing up. I lived in East Baltimore and I did a lot of work in West Baltimore, pray, educated, things like that. And so I would get, when I was younger, I would get, oh, you're from, you're from East Baltimore, you're not from here. And then growing up in West Baltimore, it's like, oh, you can't come East because what we have here is we have Charles Street that pretty much divides our entire city. And so usually people will literally go to Charles Street and stop uh, and don't go to the other side. Um, so what's very interesting about this here is that you had this highway to nowhere um, that literally carved its way through uh, primarily uh, Black communities within West Baltimore. Um, the area from West Baltimore traditionally was very uh, Black, and this area here actually has transitioned over time, but it was a, a Polish, it was a Polish neighborhood. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it was interesting when we did our, um, our, our, our reflection piece um, and our um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we did at the Smithsonian in our pop-up, which I appreciate you, Elizabeth, for that. Um, we really had a conversation between the, the, the photos. 
And the conversations weren't just about East versus West. It was also very triggering for some people. Um, my aunt, who is in her early 60s, um, said that she, she has a best friend now that she grew up two blocks away. But she they but it was a church that was there that was their dividing line. So people could attend the church. But if you went two blocks over, you literally would get beaten up if you went to the other side or possibly killed. If you went to the other side, you would be possibly beaten up and killed. And I, when I heard her say, yo, you, you can't go, I'm thinking of it from a sense of this is somewhere you prefer not to go because it's going to be uncomfortable. She said, no, you could not go or you would be hurt, literally. And so seeing the photos, it really kind of jarred me because we really had a conversation. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so it was a lot of, uh, it's a lot of tension, but also we relate. Because if you look at that stoop, I think it was Sarah who said that those are those conversations that are happening every single day. So you may have someone that lives, a, a Polish family, they might live across from a Black family. They may only attend church together, but then they would never interact. Um, and then myself, I'm in my early 40s, so I, I, I've experienced racial tension within Baltimore, but never an aggression of that level. And so that was very interesting. Um, also, this highway to nowhere um, literally carved through neighborhoods and they, and they stopped here. And so I, while I appreciate the strength of these communities that really say, look, we're going to stand up. We're not going to allow you to build literally this highway just to carve through our city. Unfortunately, Black neighborhoods were were traditionally not listened to and they continue to be not listened to to the fact of literal buildings, neighborhoods and history was really knocked down. And so through this process, I learned a lot about my own neighborhood that I had been in for, for years. Um, I think Sarah brought up uh, something about uh, the Poe Homes. Yes, so with Edgar Allan Poe, who was one of my favorite writers of all time, of course, amazing. Um, so he his actual home is within the housing project within Baltimore. So if you're coming off of 695 uh, or you're coming into Baltimore, um, it's about maybe five or 10 minutes once you come off the highway, his home is there. And so it's really interesting just to see this person was an incredible writer, but also dealt with, of course, a lot of tension, alcoholism and things like that, to have his home in an area that's still very tense and still dealing with a lot of issues. It's very, it's, it's, it's interesting. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Sarah. Um, yes, you want the ten tenibulation of the bells. I love it. Yes. <laughs> cool, and cool. Kareem, I'm, a, I'm a literary good nerd too, so I love <laughs> stop there. Kareem, when you say carved through, I think I'm going to interject. What I did not understand about the highway to nowhere is that it's it's literally like a 20 foot section down into the ground that was carved out for a four lane highway. Yes. So it's like a, a fully removed portion of the city that mm. was intended to be this kind of conduit of people into downtown and then back to their suburban area. And then it was scrapped as you can see in 1981. So the section of it was made, but then it was a, a, a project that was sort of tabled and then it, it doesn't really serve any purpose. And all the modern photographs I've seen of it have like one car on it and it's, that's, that's it. There's just no reason yeah. for it anymore. It's, it's like a literal, it maybe saves you one and a half minutes of, of traffic. So, I mean, it's literally not necessary. Um, and when we did our, um, our oral history, one of the subjects of the oral history, she talked about her neighborhood. She actually lived in that neighborhood mm. and her home was destroyed as a result. Mm. Yeah. And so it's incredible how these things are happening. And even now, um, and this is to be totally non-political, but it became a political issue here was because they were trying to build a red line that would connect West Baltimore uh, to, to East Baltimore through, a, through our light rail system. And our governor, um, Hogan, shut, shut it down. Uh, funding was there from the federal government, local, state, everybody was for it, would have brought dozens and dozens of jobs, well, not even dozens, dozens, hundreds of jobs to that area um, and, and helped out our transportation, transportation system. I'm sorry, that's definitely, uh, we need a better transportation system. He literally shut it down. So it brought up a lot of issues that happened 30, 40 years ago because people were upset because they said, well, first you build this highway to nowhere. Then when we can actually 
make good use of this space, you now shut it down again. So it was a re-traumatizing for many people within their neighborhood, um, re-traumatizing of what happened 40 years ago. So very interesting. So will you tell us more about Voices of 21217, Kareem? Because your project is incredible and I want people to have a chance to learn more about the city, but also see your students work. Appreciate it. So I left um, my website in the chat. Um, I will do it again. .org. So um, I started this uh, organization uh, about, about two and a half years ago. Um, I was inspired actually after um, the Freddie Gray uprising here in Baltimore. Because what happened around that time, it wasn't just uh, uh, his, his, his gruesome murder um, at the hands of police that really upset everyone. It was also that he was just a part of a long line of, of just compacted trauma that happened. So it's like, I, I'm poor. I live in a country that does not like black people in general, or has shown historically not to like black people in general. Um, and, and then after that, now the police who are supposed to secure us, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of his particular case, um, cause we could talk another several hours about that. But he, he was then subsequently taken into a van and he, and he uh, was in the van, he was alive, then he went to the hospital and he died. And so the image of him being dragged by the police was uh, really spread around the whole world, like wildfire. Like I've never seen Baltimore um, in the news like that ever. And so, um, I came actually, at the time I was actually living in North Carolina for, for, for a year doing some, some other work. I came back up and to see military vehicles coming down my street where I literally played at, I heard these things from my mother who experienced the 1968 riots, but to see a tank drive down your street and guns being pointed at children is beyond frightening. And so it definitely had, as you said, echoes of the 68 riots. And so some people see that and they're either entertained or they say, oh, it's so sad or what's going on or what's happening. But just the reality of seeing that and not being able to explain it to the youth why this is happening was really, um, it, it, was a, it was a challenge. And, but the other thing that I saw was that we were all up on the corner um, this is at Pennsylvania Avenue and North Avenue, where they said the, the uprising took place or whatever. Um, we were literally locked arm in arm, grassroots organizers, uh, people from the community. And we built a line between the police um, who, who had a line there. I don't know why, but they just had a line uh, in that area. And of course, the community was on one side upset. You had a line of people in the middle and then a police line. But as I, as I noticed and you looked over, the media didn't show this as much, but there were drummers, there were singers, there were photographers, videographers, dancers, performers, like literal drum circles in the middle of the street that really brought healing to this situation. And so I thought to myself, if this one image can cause this entire uprising, what could dozens and or hundreds of images of, of positivity or the reality of our neighborhood do to inspire change? And so that's when I came up with the um, first started thinking about voices of 21217. And so our organization uh, really is set up to provide opportunities for youth between the ages of 14 to 24 to center their stories. Because what's happening is it's not that stories aren't being told, it's that they're looking for that one singular story, that singular Black story of struggle, which is a misnomer on top of a lie um, mixed in with confusion. And I really mean everything that I'm saying, because as each of us here have layered and nuanced stories, there are layered and nuanced stories. Freddie Gray wasn't just a guy who got killed by the police. He was an uncle. He was a member of the community. He actually was really popular. That's why some people were so upset about it. So you have to understand these are human beings. And so what we wanted to do was to, through this program, to really humanize our neighborhoods and, and not so that to prove anything, but just to just show what was happening. And so when Elizabeth approached me about it, our first conversations were not about photography. It was about who are you, Elizabeth, and who am I, Kareem? <laughs> yeah. Because um, I guess if you can clearly, you know, clearly, clearly see, 
Um, we we're done, we come from different backgrounds, we come from different spaces, but we all love the arts and what it can do to help to change. And so we first got to know each other and where we were coming from. And then also because of the uh, what happened, of course, with COVID and that we all went through, um, our, our, our program kind of took on a really, um, it took on a different uh, need because during that time, youth were locked in their homes um, like everybody else. They didn't have any way to learn. Um, they, they couldn't interact with their teachers, with their friends. And they were very upset and really weren't trusting of adults at that time. And so what this program did was not only give the youth the opportunity to center their stories, but also show their dignity and that we had not forgotten about them because grassroots organizations are the first responders in our community. Many times before they talk to the police, before they talk to an ambulance, before they talk to any other first responder, they're talking to us. Like I've literally walked up on people going, having, um, uh, who were overdosing. Before the police got there, before the ambulance, we were there. And we had to make the people, make them feel safe. We had to make them feel okay so that the police just don't run up and hurt them um, and or try to just lock them up. So sometimes our first responders are really, really important. And as we know, as educators, um, last year, I guess people figured out that educators matter. I don't know, but we are, we, we're very much the first responders. And so this was a part of that process. And so with the uh, Voices of 21217, we work with a group of youth, about four or five youth from this school here, uh, this is actually a charter school in Baltimore called the Islamic Community School. It's a school that I grew up in in Baltimore, which is literally two blocks away from the CVS that you guys saw burning down during the Freddie Gray uprising. Um, and so what we decided to do was to really dignify this neighborhood. So I just want to look through some of the photos real quick. Um, and then Elizabeth, please let me know when I need to stop. Uh, so these photos here are representative of what we saw within our community. And so this is actually one of our photographers um, in front of uh, a church, a historic church right at uh, Drew Hill and North Avenue. Um, and as you can see, she has on a scarf because it's a traditional Muslim school. Um, and one thing that I particularly love about this picture is just the juxtapose of her smiling, a Muslim young lady in front of a church in this area that's actually starting to come up itself. So one thing we wanted to do was to resist gentrification that's actually happening within West Baltimore because people um, from University of Maryland Hospital and other places are starting to really move into West Baltimore. And so we wanted to be able to preserve um, those images and those people. This couple that we have here, when we walked up and they saw what we were doing, they said, please take a picture and let people know, don't forget about us. Like they, that, that was their literal words. And so um, uh, one of our youth took this incredible picture here because as you can see, even amongst these buildings that we drive down or we drive past every single day, there are people that live there, that value it and they love what's, you know, what's happening within their community. Um, you wanna go to the next slide? All right, cool. So um, before I go into, into this, um, I'm gonna pause it for a second. So um, as a part of what we do is that we also, um, we have on our website, we do a series that's called Zones, which is a um, anthology series where we're following youth throughout Baltimore that are doing a lot of uh, different incredible things. So with our youth, they are photographers. As we know, I'm gonna show you a quick picture of us at the Smithsonian. Um, but this right here is uh, just a trailer that we shot. Um, and this, this youth that we have here, Antonio Moore is an incredible young man uh, 21 years old, and he actually uh, sells um, uh, properties in Baltimore. So he has a book that's called The Flip Project, because his project is more than about just um, selling homes. His is about flipping your, your mindset and your community and looking at, a, at these buildings that we have in Baltimore that are abandoned and looking at them more as opportunities to, um, to help the community. So I'm going to allow Liz, if you could bring up the uh, sound. And then we could just look at the trailer real quick. If people ain't saying this, and it's all for them to make sense of it. Like I could tell them, look, I did a real estate deal. You know, I took an apartment, put it on a contract for 360,000, sold it three months later for 420,000, made 60 I could show them, I could say that. I could tell them the story about that, right? But if they not saying this, then it's kind of hard for them to see that. Like, so 
when I was having conversations about it, and I still do, um, I had to learn to speak the language, keep the uniform on. So it's, it's hard for people to understand, like, all right, look, I can actually do this. I could invest in real estate. I don't got to go get a license, be a realtor. I can participate in the thing that we participate in every day. So, you know, um, definitely people, once they understand it, you draw them in with the money. And then once they understand the money, then once they learn the significance of it, it'll change their life forever. They'll never be able to unsee it. So there you um every day in Baltimore. Um, could you go to the photo gallery real quick? I'm sorry. Uh, so there you every day in Baltimore that are making um that are I think might be on the main page that are making a difference. There we go. All right, cool. So the youth every day that are making a difference. Um, the youth that we had here, we actually uh, got a chance to to uh, show, have our fo first showing at the Smithsonian, and so it was an incredible conversation uh, between the the uh, photographs. Thank you. And um, so our photographs were here, um, and that's actually one of our amazing photographers, um, Marjana. And it was a, a really incredible conversation between just not only East and West Baltimore, also a lot of the images were of Polish communities and this, um, and this, uh, I'm sorry, in our photos were about African-American communities. Also what was happening now as we see with everyone with their mask on is that we're dealing with COVID. And so our communities have totally changed how we communicate, how we engage and interact. And I, and I saw a, you know, a couple of folks earlier talking a little bit about the stoop. And so just the idea of being on your stoop and interacting with people has now totally changed and shifted because of COVID. And so even talking to your neighbors, even talking to your family members, you, you, you couldn't. You know, some of us haven't seen our family in over two years. And so to be able to uh, do this project during this particular challenging time in this challenging neighborhood, but then be able to go to the Smithsonian and be able to, to have this conversations uh, with uh photos that were produced by youth in Baltimore was incredible. So um, it, it, it definitely was a great uh, project. Um, a lot of youth that were here, they were saying, man, I didn't even know that I could do this. I didn't even know that this was possible. So sometimes just opening up those doors, um, you'll be able to see the genius that is already in our kids and already in our youth. If we just open up a door and just ask those questions and give them an opportunity. And so um, please feel free to go to our website. I know we're going to be doing some more conversations, but um, please feel free to go to our website, learn some more. Let's continue to interact and start to, to ask these challenging uh, questions. Awesome. Thank you, Kareem. So it was really, a, a, for me, a really incredible experience to hear from students. So we were learning about Baltimore together. So we were looking at these historical photographs. We were reading oral history excerpts from the same time period as the photographs. And then the students were thinking about kind of what are the big ideas? What was their city going through at the time? And then they were going out into the city, taking photographs of their neighborhoods, and then even um, sitting down with family members, with elders in their community and saying, I read this thing about the 1970s, but like, how do you remember it? What was, what was this like? Um, so we're going to give you all a chance to um, practice this idea of continuity and change over time with the Jamboard. Sorry, I was all kinds of crazy with the technology earlier, but this is a clip of the Jamboard. The idea is you are going to go into breakout rooms. We're going to spend probably like 12 minutes to be specific, um, looking at um, each one of the groups will get a tile. Um, you're going to look at the works together. So the top line are those works that we looked at really closely from the 1970s. And the bottom line are the works that were made just this year by Kareem students. Amongst your group, you are going to figure out which of the two photographs, which two photographs rather, would you pair up to kind of create an interesting story or, or um, a, like a thesis statement? Um, you need to take one from the blue bar and one from the yellow bar. Then you're going to delete everything else off the screen so that you have space to write and you're going to talk it out and document when you put these two images together what theme or topic do they suggest what do you know about the 1970s and about 2021 um what's relevant do you think what's going on in the world in american history um and then of that stuff 
what seems important or significant to these particular images. If you identify that you don't have enough information, that's great. Just make a running list of research questions or things that you wonder. And then just based on the image, look for things that have changed. So this should feel pretty easy what, what has changed, at least based on these images, recognizing that you know, the, the survey photographers took 10,000, we're only giving you a choice of one, that Kareem students took hundreds, but we're giving you a choice of one. But what seems to have changed, but then also, is there anything that you saw and heard either in the image or through our conversations today that seems to have stayed the same? And you might need to think more conceptually, not necessarily like, oh, that particular house, because it could still be there, but like, think also more broadly and conceptually. And then consider finally, what in the world, like why do you think some things were allowed to change and then some other things were allowed to stay the same? I'm kind of based on that, like what questions do you need to ask? So before I send you into breakout rooms, do you have questions? Because I just threw a bunch of stuff at you. I'm not hearing anything, okay. Um, I'm gonna make three breakout rooms. So it's going to be small groups. That's okay. You're going to go to the um, the tinyurl.com slash explore ccot. You're going to find your slide that has your number on it. So when you um, go into the breakout room, it will assign you a, a breakout room number, and that's how you know where to go. So I will see you all again in 12 minutes. Hello, friends. That was not nearly enough time, was it? <laughs> <laughs> never is um so i think we just got our sticky note finished in my group like you're the second close up, i think we're good awesome you're amazing um <laughs> So I would like to respect the everybody's time knowing this is the end of a long day. I would also love to hear from one representative of each group just quickly like what what were maybe the highlight of your conversation. So let's say what what is your theme and what was the highlight of your conversation? Like what what seemed rich about it? So group one, we're looking at your work. Would you share with us what your theme is? Like what was a highlight or a rich point from your conversation? I can share. So I put some notes in there. Hopefully they make sense. Um, we were talking about the concept of community and the role of the stoop um, in the community. Um, we noticed that there was less interaction on the stoop due to the pandemic. If you look at 2021 um, and it made us question, well, do people still interact if neighbors are needed? And how does that look? because it's very different from the 1970s. And we came to the concept that it was less gathering, but more one-on-one -on -one interaction, mm -hmm. um, thanks to Kareem's insights too. Um, but we saw the same pride in community, people still wanting to be on the stoop. Um, and then also we made a note about elders not in the picture as much. And this made us wonder if they we were trying to keep um, them safe from COVID. And maybe that's why we don't see as much of the intergenerational. So that's kind of as far as we got with that. That's gorgeous. You got yes. so far. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, that's awesome. Okay, group two, will you walk us through what, what is your theme and what was the highlight of your conversation? Oh man, uh, am I gonna talk? <laughs> You're gonna talk. You're so brave. Uh, well, we got caught up in themes, but I guess I'll just pick one of the ideas, one of the themes. Um, and I'll go with the self-confidence. Mm. Um, so there was kind of this like idea that um, both um, that the people in both images were confident and comfortable with um, who they are, kind of what they're wearing, um, which made us seem that they were um, comfortable in their community, in their neighborhood. Um, and then what do you know about, um, and then we also talked about the idea that maybe now there's more cultural resources offered in the neighborhood. So the idea that there's a Muslim school 
now. So hence why she may feel comfortable and um, wearing her scarf around her head. And, um, you know, she seems to be smiling or she seems to be happy there. And um, where back then, maybe there was just more traditional public schools. And um, I don't know what the education is like in Baltimore, but sometimes public school can be really difficult. And depending on what kind of neighborhood you live in, you may not have the best education. So um, that was something that we talked about. And then we also talked about the boarded up windows and um, are those boarded up buildings, are they, have they been abandoned now or are they being renovated for new families to come in? Um, and am I missing anything else, group two? <laughs> You did great. job. Okay. <laughs> All well right. Done. Thank great you. observation. Great observation. Both for That's great really cool. All right, okay. group three. What can you tell us? We would love to know more. So for our group, we focus on definitely what can we find within the images and describing, of course, the topics and themes. And we just looked in depth on how possibly these, these two images can be compared. Uh, definitely in relation to the size of the group, mm -hmm. as well as comparing the fact that they're both on their front stoop or on their steps of their homes, as well as um, reflecting upon how they are sitting and reflect, um, sitting and their gestures mm -hmm. and looking towards it. Mm -hmm. the camera as well as their surroundings in comparisons to um, their possibilities of why, of the importance of their placement in relation to sitting on the front stoop when posing for the camera. Mm -hmm. So we emphasize upon the socialization amongst family, friends, neighbors, and strangers, and possibly strangers. Mm -hmm. And of course, the differences of the two families due to um, their size and, um, and how they're interacting with each other. Beautiful. Thank mm. you. Awesome. All right. So. so here's my final question set for you all. You just did this, right? And you, you dug around in the idea of continuity and change over time. It was certainly not enough time. Um, but each of you, um, I hope, have started to get kind of a sense of um, what are the challenges and also the the points of interest of continuity and change over time. So I'd be curious just to know, like as you were doing this work, what made it challenging to look for things that were the same and things that were different? Technology aside, because sometimes technology gets in the way. Are we saying this or are we yes. writing Oh it? my gosh. Please speak, speak aloud. What were the challenges and, and points of interest? Thank you for asking. Uh, I think something that's always challenging when looking at like photographs that um, have history in them is I, I don't like making assumptions because it's, it's like making assumptions of people. You don't want to assume something about someone and then be wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it feels like you're being, it sounds like you're being kind of ignorant or naive about someone's history or culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so I always find that really challenging. Beautiful. Thank you. So mm -hmm. you want to be respectful while you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, um, you know, it's like you judging a book by its cover, mm. um, you don't, you know, you don't really know what's inside until you read the pages. Um, so you can, you can, you could guess um, by looking deeply into the photographs and trying to take in as much imagery as imagery as you can, um, and based on your knowledge, making an inference, but it may not be correct. Um, and again, if we make the wrong, you know, judgments. Um, you know, that could be damaging or hurtful. 
So um, it's always better to like we were doing is sort of doing the general um, as you know artists and writers uh, doing the general um, you know um, picking out things that we recognize um, rather than going too deep to something we may not know about. Mm, beautiful. So our knowledge or lack thereof is the lens through which we see and recognizing that that our own experience or our lack of experience will will color and change the way that we perceive someone else. Yeah, beautiful. Any additional challenges? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Dan. Yeah, so, you know, in in community based art, right, or community art, it, they, there's the whole, um, you know, uh, strategy of asset mapping, right, mm -hmm. and and seeing what is a community's assets, what are their assets, and to, you know, I, I, it's a, a best practice or a trend to, um, you know, involve the community in that process, and also to not think of like what a community needs as a deficit, but what are the, what does the community have to offer, right? What are mm. its strengths, its cultural traditions, you know? And, and I think um, you, you need to, you need that thorough understanding, right? And to, to view things maybe, you know, something might look like an abandoned building, but we don't know its role or its relevance to that community or that culture, you know, or, or what's on the other side of it, right? Um, Beautiful. Thank you. I'll say it. The perspective of the people in the image, their insights and their communities and how they may differ from that of the photographer or the viewer, right? So in one case, we had photographers from outside the community taking photographs. And in one case, we had photographers from inside the, the um, community taking photographs and recognizing that that, that is a, a distinctly different um, perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When we are searching for things that change or stay the same, was there anything interesting about that? I would say the tension that people brought up in that photo, the first photo of the, of the three young men, I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting because I saw a different tension, but kind of looking at it from the outside, looking at it, I was like, wow, that's an interesting tension. And I'm wondering, because they were white female photographers at that particular time, did they interact with them where their interactions different, even when she took the photos where she's trying to show tension, where some of the other photos are a little more about like a, a, a day in the life of people and kind of more happiness and joy where that one was more tension. And so I know over time, we still have struggles with race relations, of course, uh, systemically in Baltimore, but I would say culturally, there's a lot more, just like the entire country and world, there's a lot less issues in regards to like one-on-one -on -one relationships when it comes to race. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine not walk, being able to walk across the street and someone tried to hurt me. Mm -hmm. I can understand the tension because I've been in intense situations, but not you literally want to hurt me because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. So just my presence alone is an attack on you mm -hmm. or vice versa. And so I thought that was, that was, that, that has changed over time, mm -hmm. but I, it's just interesting how, how people saw that. So Kareem, I unpacked that two ways. I heard you um, appreciating the opportunities to compare impressions and understandings. Mm -hmm. And then I also heard you appreciating the opportunities to become curious and know more beyond what's represented. Absolutely. Did I get you? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. What, what more is interesting about looking for things that either have changed or stayed the same? And that's a question for anyone. Mm. I would say common language. I think everyone kind of knows about gentrification, like what that is. Um, I think as a country, we all are a lot more aware of uh, relations between, you know, race and then also like community arts, including the community more in, into it. And Dan brought that up, what I thought, thought was a great point and just making sure communities are part of it and looking mm -hmm. at asset mapping as opposed to deficits. And I think um, during that time, you probably saw more deficit mapping. Well, I think now people are looking more into the asset mapping. So I th that was a great, a great point um, that was brought up. That's awesome. um, and then the curiosity about community, because if I'm from Northern Virginia, my reflection on what's happening may be a little bit different than someone that's from Brooklyn, because they, they, they may, we may relate in regards to an urban environment 
um even though we may come from different cultural backgrounds we may relate more with that so yeah yeah thank you sarah's noted in the chat box also that she was um, intrigued by considering the use of space over time so when we start to look for things that that remain over time we recognize that there are these themes that spool out and that shape that space may be used and then disused and used again and and this kind of ebb and flow um so obviously it is six o'clock we have had such rich conversations but where i want to kind of land is each time we ended in questions the intent was to end in wonder and curiosity or recognizing gaps in knowledge because i do think that often when we put two pieces of historical documentation together and we say what's changed and what stayed the same we're we're asking people to essentially draw a straight line when the line between them is actually quite wiggly and three-dimensional or it's not a line at all it's dots or something else and so recognizing that this um this place of curiosity where we're uncovering lack of knowledge or or a wonder and ending up there over and over again um, was intended to move us toward this idea that human stories and community are a lot messier than the one to one um, connection and that when we start to think about the kind of dispositions that we need to still instill in our students, we might want to start thinking about that and how to apply that to our practice. Um, so that's what I've got for you. I'm so grateful it is 6.01, we managed to, to get done. 